Commission and Reggie's approach on agricultural relief and dwelling house relief cases. And um, for those of you who don't know Brian, Brian is a chartered tax advisor and a staff practitioner with O'Hanlon Tax Advisors. And um, he works on tax compliance on income tax, cash, and VAT. He works exclusively in trust and estates um, with a focus on the production of fiduciary accounts for trustees and personal representatives and tax compliance matters associated with trust and estates. Um, including dealing with the position for trustees, personal representatives, and the beneficiaries. And um, so, without further ado, I'll hand you over to Frank. Thanks, Tina. Um, yeah, so as kind of you know, Tina kind of said, that's what I'm going to uh, come to uh, today. The um, suppose the stuff on data mining um, and 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 how to use the data. It's actually going to be in the context of progress and even the revenue affidavit, um, which has been something that, that revenue hasn't um, probably utilised to its fullest potential uh, over the years. Um, I suppose just in terms of a bit of background on, um, on, on revenue's approach to uh, tax compliance, um, audits, and, 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 and revenue interventions, the, I suppose the advent of full self assessment um, resulted in, I suppose, kind of a bit of a shift. Um, the gradual shift, but it's kind of very pronounced now. But revenue focus is, is very much on monitoring tax compliance, as opposed to uh, providing um, kind of customer service and, and uh, advice to, uh, to individuals. What's the time you bring up revenue with a query, and to be able to give you a view on it, and they may assist you with your tax matters. Nowadays, um, it's that's quite limited, and revenue resources are very much focused on, on monitoring tax compliance and, and, and making interventions where feel it's necessary to make interventions to ensure tax compliance. They are analysing the data available to them and are preparing with the returns files to try and identify cases where they feel taxpayers are potentially not being compliant um, and to raise the queries with, with, with a view obviously to actually program the tax that, uh, that may be due to them. So I suppose just a bit of background in terms of, of, of figures um, on revenues, interventions, and numbers of interventions and, and, and recovery. In 2017, uh, there was 5,220 audits uh, per the revenue annual report. And only 400 of those audits were random reports or random interventions, which means that um, the balance of them were targeted. They were targeted on the back of revenue analyzing information um, and, and, and targeting specific taxpayers for specific reasons. The um, one or kind of two examples um, that um, I, I use quite a bit um, are, are one um, situation where we had um, a client who was a PY taxpayer and they received a gift of funds to purchase a, a property. Um, they had purchased the property um, and paid the stamp duty and went off about their business. Um, the gift was under the CAT threshold, under 80%, there's no need to file a return. So there's no interaction with revenue other than the uh, filing of the stamp duty return. Revenue took the stamp duty return, they looked at the stamp duty return, they looked at the value of the house that was purchased from the stamp duty return, they looked at the most recent P60 for the, the taxpayer, they figured that the salary that was included in the P60 was not of a level that would be able to afford the value of the house that was purchased. So they raised a query, a uh, target intervention, um, whereby they, uh, they, 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 they raised it as an income tax uh, query with the, uh, the, um, the purchaser the property, basically uh, with, with a view to recover an income tax and, um, and, and, and a claim that there must have been some income that's been unreturned. It transpired that uh, there was a gift, it was dealt with, in terms of response to revenue under 80 percent no tax implications. Um, but it's a good example, I think, that highlights where revenue are taking information from different sources and raising queries for the field that uh, the tax may be due. The LPT records, um, a lot of people will be familiar with revenue use of LPT records to build up a property database where a tax number is uh, linked to more than one uh, property, each property has a property ID, where you've got a single tax number, multiple properties, no rental income being included in an income tax return, Revenue can raise uh, queries on uh, what the, the properties are being are being used for. So revenue take a risk-based approach to the uh, tax compliance, uh, and revenue see risk as, as, as cash basically in the potential for tax defaults. So the uh, they identify a case where there's a particularly high amount that's a higher risk for revenue than a case where they, 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 they feel there may be a, a small amount of tax due. So they're obviously going to be selecting the uh, the riskier cases where. Uh, the, uh, the risk of, of loss to the exchequer is greater. Um, the um, revenue, they want to maximise return interventions by using the resources available to them. 
And so they're, they're using the data, they're using their personnel, they're, they're very focused on uh, taking information and, and using that information to, to target uh, taxpayers. Um, it's an extract from the 2017 annual report again, which, which, which sets that out in, in plain and simple English. Uh, deploy our resources on a risk basis and have access to large amounts of data and information from third party sources and global tax networks. We use data analytics to, analytics to identify non compliance and the nature of the intervention is determined by the non compliance behavior of the taxpayer. So there's a number of different ways that revenue can make an intervention, um, but at the, back, back, the background to all of that is um, that there is a sophisticated uh, revenue system which is using the data available to it to them um, from a lot of different sources, some of them from uh, international sources, um, the likes of banks, um, there's, a, there's a multitude of, of sources of revenue, revenue and they're increasingly using them efficiently to target taxpayers. The 2018 headline results uh, have been um, uh, recently enough uh, revealed by, by revenue and when you compare that to 2017, you can actually see interestingly enough that the interventions uh, have gone down from 649,419 to 572,785. That to me was interesting. But, uh, and I suppose the most inter interesting part of that was that the yield has stayed almost exactly the same, a very minor drop. So in 2017, there was an average yield of 870, 887 euro per intervention. In 2018, it's just under 1,000 euro. So they have less interventions in 2018, but the same amount of tax. So you can actually see in the figures how they are getting more intelligent. They're using their systems. To, um, to target taxpayers more effectively and also to recover more with the, the same amount of resources and in this case recovering more or recovering the same uh, with, with, uh, with less resources. So this I suppose all then feeds into um, revenues cut strategy which was announced last year um, and I suppose to me um, the cut strategy was uh, very much a we're not really uh, carrying out this sort of risk analysis on the inland revenue affidavit um, and in probate cases um, and we, we, we see this as a, a somewhat of a shortfall and we're going to uh, we're going to start using the inland revenue affidavit the information available to us to uh, start risk profiling cases where we've got dead cases where we've got probate cases so um, just going to run through uh, both the inland revenue affidavit what I would see is opportunities uh, for revenue to really tap into that as a resource um, and, 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 and use it to, to raise queries and to ultimately to, uh, to recover tax um, in, 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 in COVID cases. <coughs> I have seen, and Pan and Tax have seen, um, the, the IRA being used to a greater extent uh, in, the, um, uh, in, in the last uh, couple of years, more so than previously. There was a case where, or it used to be the case where we um, send in a request for a letter from a audit um, on a, uh, a disposal by an estate and revenue would look for information in relation to the disposal and issue a letter of no audit. Um, now, nowadays we're finding that if we look for a letter of no audit, revenue are looking for more information, they're looking for a copy of the IRA, they're looking for a copy of the will, they're, 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 they're looking at the case more before they actually issue that letter of no audit. So, in a case where you're where, where you're going, you're formally looking for that tax clearance uh, revenue. Are um, they're looking at the, uh, the cases in a bit more detail? Um, so what we're seeing is queries and other estate assets when uh, we're asking revenue to review the tax of CGT and, and to get clearance for the estate. They're raising queries in other aspects of the estate as well. The um, cash strategy is primarily focused on cap risks, but uh, I think it's inevitable that you'll see increased interventions in income tax and CGT as well, both for the estate and something I think that would be of more concern to person representatives would be potentially the pre-debt taxes, um, where a lot of what's happened uh, historically uh, with the executors are on the line for uh, may not be visible to the, uh, the person representatives who are carrying on the administration of the estate, but in terms of tax risks uh, for, for any only fair tax, the risk uh, lies very firmly with the with the person representatives. So, in reviewing the um, the IRA um, uh, revenue, uh, we would look to, to potentially uh, compare the, the assets in the IRA with the income tax information that they have on record for the deceased taxpayer. Um, and I, I think in the main, what they what they look to is the, uh, the properties that are contained uh, in the IRA or set out in the IRA, the shares that uh, are, are potentially included, and then. Uh, deposits, uh, specifically non-Irish deposits, which is kind of large deposit accounts, I think is likely to, uh, to attract uh, revenue attention. 
The, um, on the property side of it then, if you look at residential property, the, again, the 2017 annual report indicated that there's a total of 5,332 revenue interventions in the, rec in the rental sector in 2017. And this yielded uh, just under 45 million uh, in, in tax. It's an average of 38,410. And I think when you compare that average of 8,410 to the average of 1,000 euro per the headline results for 2018, um, the, the rental sector is something that, uh, that revenue are likely to continue to focus on. Um, given the, uh, the the fact that the, the yield on the uh, rental interventions uh, is is substantially higher, that's eight times higher the average yield across the board uh, for uh, for all revenue uh, interventions. So it's always been an area that the revenue will focus on. I think that's likely to continue. Um, and <coughs> it's um, the information is contained in my array in terms of properties, a list of properties. Uh, if there haven't been, uh, if if the taxpayer has to do, who has to be declined in their lifetime. For whatever reason it hasn't been picked up by the revenue system as, as, as a risk. I think it's likely that the IRA will certainly be, uh, if, 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 if revenue don't have the systems in place as of yet, and I, I pretty much feel they're, 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 they're almost there, um, they're certainly, uh, I think, very soon going to be looking at a uh, number of properties in the IRA, and if there haven't been pre like tax returns included, uh, including rental income, I think it's likely that, uh, that, that the queries will be, ra will be raised. Um, if there are then, obviously, um, as there, as, as, as there is in many cases, um, valid reasons for no rental income, holiday homes, uh, etc. Uh, revenue could potentially look for uh, uh, for proof um, of, of occupation as, as, as rental properties, payment of bills, uh, etc. Um, On to shares then, um, and shares uh, included in, 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 a, in a revenue affidavit. Again, classic thing you'd be looking for under PDEX. Uh, returns would be uh, dividend income shown up in the pre debt returns, uh, and if there uh, is no dividend income shown up in pre debt returns, but there's a substantial share portfolio included in the income revenue affidavit, you may well be getting uh, queries from revenue uh, as, the, uh, as the personal representative. And cash savings, I suppose this is um, a little bit similar to uh, a PY taxpayer with, with relatively low income purchasing a, uh, a, an expensive house. If there's a substantial uh, sum of cash uh, in a uh, deposit account uh, included in the assets in the IRA that's out of sync with the income profile of the uh, of the deceased, um, particularly in a situation if that um, deposit account is is abroad um, and has been out of sight of the uh, the revenue commissioners, and you could potentially be getting um, uh, queries on that. The other thing that's um, included in the Inland revenue affidavit, the first page of the Inland revenue affidavit is the residence and domicile position of a taxpayer. So again, if revenue are looking at a, an IRA, they're looking at pre-debt tax returns, somebody who's recorded themselves non-domiciled in the tax returns, um, because of the, um, I suppose the, the advantages that go with that in terms of not being charged with income tax on, um, on foreign income if they're non-domiciled, unless it's actually remitted into Ireland. Um, but having returned their pre debt tax returns uh, to uh, uh, indicate that they're, they're not domiciled in Ireland, but the IRA was to, uh, was to indicate that um, uh, the, the individual was uh, in fact domiciled, that could potentially raise periods of revenue uh, in terms of when did that change in domicile occur and is there income that hasn't been returned um, on the basis that tax returns have been, uh, have been filed on a non-domiciled basis, but the IRA is now saying that the individual is domiciled. Um, that, I suppose, just as a, uh, I could see a solicitor filling in an IRA, that's quite, you know, what might be a relatively innocuous field um, to take and, and to possibly uh, potentially not, not ask the question, make an assumption um, that, uh, that an individual is domiciled in Ireland. It can obviously have then massive implications if, if, if somebody who uh, wasn't domiciled uh, has been indicated as domiciled in the IRA. Um, and uh, it, it is potentially going to raise uh, revenue questions if, if, if there was foreign income uh, that wasn't remitted and, and tax hadn't been paid on. <coughs> the other, uh, I suppose, aspect where residency uh, domicile can come into it is the, the address um, and dwelling house relief claims. One of the first things um, that revenue would, uh, would look to uh, in a dwelling house relief claim because of the requirement of the disponer to be uh, to be living in the uh, dwelling house, would be a, a situation 
uh, where that, that address uh, varies from the, uh, the address that's the uh, subject property of the relief. We had a case where a, an individual was living in uh, the, the family home, he'd separated. He had uh, started a, uh, another relationship. Um, he wasn't living in the second property, but as part of the administration of the estate, the, um, the partner um, wanted, I suppose, to have the fact that uh, there was a relationship there recorded to some extent in the documentation, so she insisted that his address in the IRA should be, uh, should be a her, her address on the basis that he was living with her. Factually, he wasn't actually living with her. Um, it wasn't his main address. And it, uh, it, 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 in that particular uh, situation, it, it really put the dwelling house really claim in jeopardy because the address included in the in the revenue affidavit wasn't the address of the house which the beneficiary was claiming uh, was uh, was was um, claiming the uh, dwelling house relief on. Um, so again, something pretty innocuous like including an address uh, which um, the the spawner obviously has been spending some time on it, but the family view is firmly that that was not his main uh, residence, it wasn't his, it wasn't his, his PPR. Um, and again, something innocuous like filling out the IRA in a certain way could really uh, put a relief claim like that in, in, in jeopardy. Um, where you have, um, I suppose, just on the subject of, of domicile, not necessarily linked to revenue and data mining, um, but that's something worth mentioning nonetheless, I think. Um, where you have um, non-domicile status for a taxpayer, it is obviously very valuable um, in that any foreign income um, is um, is chargeable on the on the remittance basis, and it really does. It, I suppose it it presents an opportunity to a certain extent. I've had a married couple in recently, um, and their concern, I suppose, was that when the spouse who is currently earning the income who's non-domicile dies. All the income will rise to the domicile spouse, and the income tax uh, return will, or the income tax liability will increase substantially. Obviously, kind of the happy income um, to uh, to uh, to fund it. So my sympathy was kind of um, a little bit tempered. Um, mm -hmm. But um, the um, the happiness was taking account of the fact that once that non-domicile spawner dies, if that non-domicile spawner dies first, this is effectively rolled up assets out there. <coughs> Could be brought into into Ireland uh, tax free, um, whereas during the owner's lifetime, it would incur a tax charge uh, as domiciled as domiciled or as um, remitted, remitted income. The um, that I suppose is something that it just can be useful if you're looking at a uh, succession planning and purpose planning. If there is a non domiciled and um, you keep those assets outside of the charged income tax, you're going to be rolling up a lot more cash and um, the tax is sub that the tax is subject to income tax. In most cases, you're going to have the CAT charge on it. It's over thresholds eventually, um, but it's uh, it's CAT of 33 percent on, on gross income as opposed to CAT on, on, on income reduced by income tax. Um, so, it, um, it if you're looking at identifying specific assets or, or value for an undomiciled individual, um, you can get value or more value to pass down. It's still going to be subject to tax, but it's more value to pass down. Um, and to be no income tax triggered uh, once it's brought in by a successor beneficiary. Uh, it's obviously then particularly useful um, where you have a US domicile spawner. Uh, that then links into a, a rule in the, the Ireland US tax treaty, which, which basically provides that if you have a US domicile spawner and you've non Irish property, the double taxation agreement, even, even though a beneficiary may be tax resident in Ireland, even though the spawner may be tax resident in Ireland. Um, the Ireland US double tax treaty um, would take it out of the charge to, to Irish, Irish CAT to the extent that the, um, the, the assets are located outside of Ireland once the, the spawner is, is, is non domiciled. So the, um, the, that particular uh, exemption is, is very valuable where it's available, and in that particular scenario, uh, it makes a, a whole lot of sense uh, to, be, to, to roll off assets uh, outside of Ireland. Uh, tax free, uh, which can then be taxed or transferred off to beneficiaries tax free. Um, it's um, a very valuable aspect of the, uh, the Ireland US Treaty, which is, uh, is often very good news uh, for, for clients uh, when they realise or are, are told that, they're, um, that they, they can avail of it. The, um, again, on the subject of domicile, not linked into um, for revenue data mining, but again, I think it's, uh, it, it's an important one to highlight. Where you have uh, offshore life policies and offshore funds, which some clients will have, there is no remittance basis for that type of income in that the, uh, the income from that uh, sort of investment 
is under Schedule D case 4 of the, uh, the tax acts, uh, whereas it's only Schedule D case 3 actually qualifies for the remittance mm -hmm. basis. So it's very easy to, to look at an individual from a general income tax perspective, it's easy to look at an individual who's not on the side uh, and take the, uh, take the view. If they're not bringing in anything into, the, uh, into Ireland, they're not charging the tax. But where you have offshore life policies and offshore funds, there absolutely is the potential for an income tax charge uh, on the income because of the, uh, uh, the actual um, schedule in case that that income uh, arises under. <coughs> Another thing, I suppose, just on the subject of uh, life policies and uh, offshore funds and investment undertakings is, um, again, something I think the most important aspect with uh, life policies, uh, investment undertakings and, uh, and offshore funds in, 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 in a probate context is to be able to uh, actually identify the fact that you have these assets, first of all. Um, it's, it, it's, uh, I've seen a lot of cases where uh, life policies um, have been included in an Inland Revenue Affidavit and the, um, uh, the tax treatment, I suppose, has to be taken into account uh, before an individual passes away and, and oftentimes, by the time you get to look at it as, uh, as a tax advisor, it's too late to actually uh, to move stuff around to, uh, to, to, to make the most benefit of, of, of the relief that's available. So, in my mind, the most important thing uh, for anybody uh, as probate practitioners to be identifying these assets uh, in the first place um, to, uh, to, even, to even know that there is some favourable tax treatment there if, if, if certain steps are taken. Um, so in a, a general context, if you have a, a transfer of property, um, in, in, in a lot of situations you'll see it by way of capital, cap, capital gains tax, capital acquisitions tax, uh, chargeable on the same event, a disponer passes property in their lifetime uh, to, a, uh, to a child, um, capital gains tax will be triggered for the disponer, capital acquisitions tax for the beneficiary, and the capital gains tax is paid by the disponer will uh, in a lot of cases be available to offset against capital acquisition tax paid by the beneficiary um, up to the, uh, the value of the, uh, the capital liability um, and once the property then is held for, for two years um, that uh, relief is available so you're not paying capital gains tax and capital acquisition tax on the same transaction effectively. So that's I suppose the most um, common use of the relief available under section 104 of the, the CAT Act. Under the same section um, or it's rather the same section is extended. It's extended in the, uh, the TCA, it's not actually extended in the CAT Act. Um, but the, that treatment is, is um, the tax on, on, on these certain investments is basically treated as, as, as CGT payable um, on, 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 on a debt in, um, in the case of life policy names of tax and then on a debt and uh, intravenous transfers in the case of a, a good offshore fund. And the tax paid uh, on the debt or on the transfer can be taken as a credit to set against capital acquisitions tax. And if you're looking at 41% exit tax on a life policy or investment undertaking investment, um, that uh, can obviously be very valuable if you have the value of that to set against the capital liability for the beneficiary. That exit tax in the case of life policies and investment undertakings is going to be deducted anyway. Um, there's, there's nothing you can do to prevent it. So, as a tax advisor, it always pains me when I see that exit tax operating and I do not see a corresponding use of that by a beneficiary because it's effectively wasted then. Um, whereas if there's a capital acquisition tax for a beneficiary, the tax efficient uh, approach is obviously to utilise that exit tax if at all possible. So, where we have um, a, a life policy, an investment undertaking, the credit's only available there on, on the tax that's operated on on the debt. A uh, good offshore fund, it could be an intervenous transfer or it could be tax operated on debt. That can be set against the, uh, the CAT of a beneficiary. In the case of a good offshore fund, this is I think a very niche point and it's you want to have a lot of things coming together for it to, uh, for, for, for to actually uh, occur in practice, but a good offshore fund basically has a tax charge every eight years um, and it's if you pay a, a, a tax on a deemed disposal every eight years when you hold a good offshore fund. I'm not going to go into identifying a good offshore fund because uh, I'm going to tax rules around that because we don't have time. I think we had time. There are potentially be negatives from the room. We started going to those rules. Um, but um, if you have a good offshore fund every eight years, is the deemed disposal. Um, and um, the, the deemed disposal, it, um, it, it, it triggers a, a tax charge if, if the value in the good offshore fund has been increasing. So if you were to um, actually dispose of it just before the eight year anniversary and dispose of it by way of gift, you'd be utilizing the tax that's occurred uh, as a result of that eight year 
uh, disposal just before the actual uh, disposal takes place and it would be particularly bad timing if you had a good offshore fund that triggered the uh, eight-year uh, exit tax and then shortly after the eight-year exit tax is, uh, or sorry, the eight-year tax on the deemed disposal is, is triggered the, uh, the hold was to die and was to pass on to somebody else and that eight years of, 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 of deemed gain, the tax on it is effectively wasted. Um, so it's, I suppose, something just to watch out for on, on, on good offshore funds in a, in a, in a pre-debt situation. There's, there's nothing you can do with that debt if, if, if the debt has occurred and it's, it, those, those events have taken place. Um, the, um, the thing, I suppose, the main thing to watch out for, uh, as I see it, on uh, life policies and, and investment undertakings and the good offshore funds and the transfers and the taxes associated with that is to make sure to try and use that, that, that tax. Uh, if, if, if at all possible. Um, if a beneficiary is taking a life policy, um, if it's nominated to a beneficiary and the beneficiary takes it uh, by way of um, the way of inheritance, uh, it doesn't trigger a cap liability, um, but other assets uh, are going to trigger a cap liability. And I suppose where this could potentially arise, where you see it arising sometimes, first of all, is where a life policy goes to a spouse. There's exit tax, there's nothing to prevent the exit tax, um, but there's no cap for the, the spouse, so it gets faced at. Whereas if the uh, the life policy was to go to a child and there was a tax liability, um, you would at least be using the, you would be using the exit tax uh, as a credit to set against the cat. Um, another situation where uh, it could, um, I suppose, result in it, it, it being inefficient is if the exit tax is, is triggered on the debt, it's nominated and the passes on the debt um, with a date of debt valuation date, um, and the, the amount of the life policy is under threshold, but the other assets that are coming potentially through the estate of the, uh, the disowner are of a certain value that it brings it over threshold on a later valuation date, but the cat isn't, uh, isn't triggered uh, until the later valuation date. So overall, in the context of the inheritance, a life policy has been received. Uh, other assets have been received through the estate. The life policy has an area of valuation date. It's under threshold. There's no cat. The other assets coming through the estate generate a cat liability. But the, um, the liability on the uh, later valuation date doesn't link into the life policy, so the tax on the life policy isn't, uh, isn't technically available uh, to set against the, uh, the assets that are passing through the estate. Um, I'm not sure if it's a point that uh, revenue would pick up on, but um, I would be, uh, I would be, uh, I'd be slow to risk it. And uh, I suppose because you see life policies nominated in a lot of cases and passed by operation of law, then, on the, the debt and don't even get anywhere near the estate. Um, the, it's, it's, it's obviously, if that's, that happens and you're, you're only coming into the, uh, in, in, into the arena giving advice uh, at that stage, it's, it's, it's too late to, uh, to prevent the issue. Um, the, uh, the issue has, has, has there's nothing you can do about it. Um, the, uh, the cap liability has, has, has been triggered um, and there's, um, there's no, or the, the cap event has been triggered, there's no liability, there's nothing to set the, uh, the exit tax against. Um, so I think in the case of a life policy, it probably works better to pass it through the estate, um, in which case you're apportioning the, the credit uh, for the exit tax uh, against the, um, the, the CAT payable. Um, something you could potentially consider is, I suppose, just pushing the life policy out altogether further, special power of appointment, discretionary trust, so that you've got a separate cap event that's triggering a CAT liability. Um, and potentially the full exit tax would be available uh, against the full liability on a later CAT valuation date as opposed to an apportionment between the, the life policy uh, and other assets um, on your, uh, your standard estate um, uh, liability. So I suppose just move on to um, discretionary trust. Uh, obviously any discretionary trust that's contained in the bill um, should be included in the uh, deal of revenue affidavit um, and revenue use that then to, uh, to follow, up, follow up if there's no payment of uh, discretionary tr trust tax or there's no uh, DTT returns filed. Um, the, there's not, I suppose, kind of a whole lot to say about that in terms of uh, revenue and data mining and uh, collecting data other than you put a discretionary trust into an IRA. It's going to, uh, it's been, it is eventually being notified uh, to the uh, discretionary trust tax department and revenue and crews of the race if you don't deal with the DTT position. Um, obviously, the, uh, the DTT position is um, uh, it's not necessarily tax due, uh, but in a lot of cases where there's no tax due, you'll still need to write to revenue just to explain why, uh, why there's no tax due. The, um, and the subject of discretionary trust, it's um, something that I suppose can be potentially useful. 
in a situation where you have assets. In a lot of cases where you've got assets uh, held by a, a disponer uh, who's looking at succession planning and inheritance planning, um, there's not a lot of options there to have or to use. If you don't have the type of assets that lend themselves to the, the domain release, business relief, agricultural relief, and dwelling house relief, if the assets you have don't, don't lend themselves to those uh, particular assets, or if you've, you're using those reliefs and you want to maybe squeeze a little bit extra out of it, there's not a whole lot that can be done in a lot of situations. Um, the classic, uh, I suppose, tax efficient thing to do is to ensure that you're using thresholds availing of the small gifts exemption in uh, Spona's lifetime to pass value across during the lifetime um, and, and not to have the uh, 3,000 euro uh, uh, per um, beneficiary from the Spona uh, go, uh, wa go wasted. In a situation where you've potentially got a Spona coming to uh, the end of life and there's not going to be much potential to pass across small gifts exemptions, if a Spona was to uh, consider setting up a discretionary a discretionary trust to pass to pass value into effectively uh, to pass on subsequently to, um, to 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 beneficiaries. Obviously, you have to consider the discretionary trust tax position um, of a discretionary trust um, inter vivos. Um, until the settler dies, there will be no discretionary trust tax uh, once the uh, the um, settler dies. There is the potential. If you're looking at uh, suppose grandchildren as a classic example um, of uh, a trust. Um, where DTT isn't uh, applicable until uh, a trust created exclusively for grandchild is um, is is is, is solid. Um, until until that grandchild reaches 18, um, DTT uh, generally won't arise. And if you were to uh, pass assets in a lifetime, in a disposable lifetime, into a discretionary trust like that for a grandchild, uh, by way of example, um, and if the if the disposable survives two years, then. Our technical analysis of the, uh, the legislation is such that anything that actually comes out of that discretionary trust is, is in fact a gift uh, for, for, um, for CAT purposes. Um, and if it's a gift, the, um, there, there is the, the potential uh, to, to utilise the small gifts exemption. Um, obviously it's not what the uh, legislation is intended to do um, in terms of small gifts exemption, but at the same time the legislation is clear on it. If, if, if there's a gift, you can avail of the small gifts exemption. And if you have a, a disposition into a discretionary trust, it's the, uh, it's, 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 it's the date of the disposition um, which, uh, which sets the, uh, the rule for the, um, the small gifts exemption. And I suppose you need to, you need to survive the two years. Um, technical analysis of it is such that although if you, have, if you have a gift and you die within the two years, there is a catch up for that. Um, to, uh, to continue it uh, as a gift. So, a, a, a gift um, which becomes an inheritance because it's caught by the two year rule, um, you're still able to avail of the small gifts exemption. And that's brought back in specifically. <coughs> Our reading of the legislation is such that it's um, the, w the way the, reg the legislation is structured basically is that you have to survive those two years from setting up the trust to be able to avail of payments out of the uh, out of the discretionary trust uh, in such a manner that you get a small gift exemption on, on appointments from the trust. So I suppose just kind of a, a numerical example, if you've got 54,000 uh, which could potentially be passed to a newborn, uh, newborn grandchild over 18 years, no DTT, uh, if the trust is created exclusively for that newborn grandchild um, and obviously kind of in, 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 um, in a case where you, the spawn is likely to live 18 years, um, you, you probably wouldn't be considering discretionary trust, but if you've got a disponer coming towards the end of life and you want to squeeze that kind of little bit extra uh, out of the um, uh, thresholds and um, small gifts exemption, you could consider uh, a fit 4,000, which would um, potentially save cap of, uh, of just over 7,000 euro if you have uh, a Group B uh, threshold available. And I think you want to be using that uh, Group B threshold uh, separately uh, elsewhere in, in a lot of situations as well. So I suppose in terms of other <coughs> aspects of the IRA, the revenue you can use uh, for data mining purposes, <coughs> you will look at uh, stamp duty returns, uh, CT50s, which will track sale of property, revenue can then be back to the Indian Revenue Affidavit, uh, CGT base costs from the Indian Revenue Affidavit, um, to, uh, to track this uh, or CGT may be payable on, on, on uh, following the debt, just a disposal. The gain during administration, but just some things to potentially watch out for. Um, <coughs> No charges again on transfer to, uh, to, to, to a legatee, which I'm sure uh, everyone will be aware of. Um, if the um, personal representative 
uh, sales and sales administration, you can't absolutely, you can't pay against tax. And then if there's a number of assets, uh, time and disposal of assets uh, is, 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 is always important to consider. You don't want to be triggering losses in years after, which you, in years uh, after uh, triggering gains if you, can, if you can avoid it, because you can only use current year losses or carry forward, uh, carry forward losses. Something simple, but kind of you'd be surprised how many times um, you might see cases where, um, where, where losses are, aren't utilised first, uh, where they could easily have been. Um, and then I suppose one thing that, um, see, the, uh, I, I would see a good bit, um, is the CGT liabilities where people put low values into IRAs um, on the basis that uh, we're going to be paying capital acquisitions tax on the value of the property that goes into the minimum revenue affidavit. We're going to keep values low because we want to pay less tax. Um, and that doesn't always work out, as I kind of just set out uh, a little example here. So, um, if Joe dies on the 17th of September 2018, um, go to an auctioneer. Auctioneer says value of this property is probably in the range of 500 to 530,000. So Joe's person representing his beneficiary say, well, kind of obviously we're going to put it in at the, uh, uh, the lower value because we're going to be paying tax on this asset um, and to include it in the loan of David 500,000. Grant issues on the uh, 15th of January 2019. Property was worth 550,000 on that date and it sold in February 2019 for 560,000. So if you look at the, the count on that then, 181,500 with no threshold available, no DHR, nothing you can do about that. CGT then of 19,800 from the date of death valuation <coughs> of 500,000 for the IRA and the sales proceeds of 560,000. So effectively, 50,000 rising value from the date of debt um, to the date of grant. So take the view that the value for CAT purposes on the CAT valuation, the to use take that CAT valuation as the date of grant. Look at the sales proceeds and say, well, you could equally argue if it sold for 560,000 in February 2019, it was also worked out in January uh, realistically. I uh, could certainly make that argument, but kind of say, well, you know, it probably works slightly less because, you know, you look in September to February, so it would have been a bit of, uh, would have been uniform rising value. Um, so you make that argument, but you're effectively then paying 66% tax on the rising value of the uh, 50,000 euro. Whereas if you've gone with the 530,000 euro base cost, You've got your CGT base cost of 530, you're still paying your CAT on the basis of 550, uh, maybe a slight bit higher um, if, you're, if you're going with a uniform rising value, um, and uh, you're saving uh, approximately half of the, the CGT. Um, so, not always best to uh, include a, a low value in the IRA on the assumption that you're paying less tax on a lower value in the, uh, in the IRA of the properties to be sold. So, I suppose then, what can you do about that? Um, what steps can you take to, to, to try and avoid that happening? Um, one issue that we've seen over and over again, um, and I think this has probably been an issue really since 2013, 2014, and it was a bigger issue in 2013, 2014 than it is now as well, in that it was a very unpredictable property market. You had um, people putting in values that, you know, thought they were reasonable values given, given where they were coming from, and then suddenly six months later, the property market has, 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 has improved substantially, and people are getting uh, uh, a, a good chunk more than they're anticipating the property was worth. So it, was, it definitely was a bigger issue a few years ago, but it's still an issue now because you can still get the cases where somebody is, an auctioneer has, has, has severely undervalued the property, um, or you have two, two, two purchases in the bidding war and um, uh, the, uh, the recovery for the property or the price of the property is more than anyone had, uh, had anticipated. So it's, um, and revenue are very slow to accept a corrective affidavit, CA 26. Uh, it simply devalues the property as of the date of debt on the basis that they feel that they're going to lose out on capital gains tax. So, without a uh, letter from a, the regional auctioneer to say that they made a material error in, uh, in value of the property on the, uh, the date of debt, revenue are, are in most cases simply refusing to, uh, to, to acknowledge uh, any difference in the, in the valuation on the date of debt. So, I suppose one potential solution would be maybe to put property up for sale prior to lodging the inland revenue affidavit, uh, see if you can agree a sale, see if you can tease out the market to see uh, if you're ultimately going to sell the property anyway, um, why not do it uh, before lodging the IRA to see if you've any a better idea what the sales policy would be so you can use that to actually set your, um, your debt, debt price. Um, and then another option might be to trigger an area valuation date so if a beneficiary goes in uh, and takes possession of a property um, and um, triggers the valuation date close to the date of debt, 
from a CGT perspective, it doesn't really matter then what that base cost is. Well, when you look at CGT and CAT as a whole, it doesn't really matter what the value is on the uh, on, on the data debt if you're triggering the valuation get on or close to the data debt because you're going to have 32 percent CGT in the property and you're going to have 32 sorry 32 percent capital acquisition tax in the property and 32 percent CGT on the on the rise in value from the data debt to the data sale. So triggering area valuation debt um, is 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 one place way to do that. Revenue have um, kind of made a little bit of shift on that. Uh, uh, I feel in that um, they're starting to. Starting to think, I think revenue and kind of probate, um, they're, they're starting to scale up again. They're starting to think about things a little bit more. And if they see a tax advantage to somebody triggering a data debt valuation date, they're starting to question it. So you want to be sure that you have a data debt valuation date and you can show it, that you can demonstrate possession. If you have a beneficiary going in and taking possession, you can demonstrate that. We've had cases where beneficiaries have said, yes, I've taken possession of that, and then they've come back and said, that's your main residence. You've elected potentially for that as your main residence for CGT. Now you're saying that this is your main residence, you've taken possession, you've moved in, you can't have your cake and eat it. And obviously you can see where revenue are coming from. And so it's important then if you're saying that you take possession of an asset to trigger a data debt valuation debt, you have a tax advantage as a result of that, you want to be sure that you can um, that you can demonstrate to revenue that you have taken possession. If you um, if the products were in a position to um, to, to actually send the property um, and um, and uh, and transfer it uh, by deal ascent um, as soon as possible that would obviously trigger the valuation debt. Um, and there are, other, there are other cases then where it could be worked by looking at vesting assets before uh, before sale if the sale is to be sold. One is if you have a beneficiary who has losses, uh, so capital so an estate may not have uh, an estate one of losses available on the day of debt. If the estate sells assets the estate uh, may generate losses. Um, but you're starting off at, at the, um, the date of debt, the estate does not, have, uh, does not have any losses. A beneficiary may have losses. If you have sent a property to a beneficiary, the beneficiary sells the property, the beneficiary can utilize their own losses. Whereas if the estate sells the property, the estate can have to use beneficiary losses. And, may not, and in most cases, will not have losses to uh, to shelter in the game itself. Do you have a thing then to look out for in terms of uh, vesting assets potentially before uh, sale of property? It uh, would be in a case where a beneficiary might have uh, PPR relief available to them. Um, so kind of just a quick example, Niall uh, died for June 17, family home was worth 500,000 on the date of death. The daughter moved back in 2013 to, uh, to assist him as he, uh, as, as he grew older. She, the um, decision was made to sell the property after the grant issued. Uh, it was 33% of CGT for the estate and sale, but Pam herself would uh, qualify for PPR relief because she's been living in the property uh, throughout the period as her main residence, so in a situation like that as well, uh, it's, 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 it's obviously uh, from a tax perspective, it's a no-brainer to send the property to her so that she can claim PPR relief uh, in respect of her occupation of property, whereas the estate uh, wouldn't, be, uh, wouldn't be able to. Um, revenue, obviously, then from an income tax perspective, we'll be looking at uh, the assets of the estate, looking for uh, tax rising. <coughs> Income tax standard rate for an estate, no USC or PRSI, no tax credits. Uh, the income in an estate, uh, something that uh, I, I, um, I, I feel beneficial certainly aren't aware of, um, and I'd, I'd definitely at some stage like to see facts and figures on how many beneficiaries are taking estate income and including in their own personal income tax returns. Um, I would say uh, it's potentially quite low, um, but strictly speaking, that's what should be happening. Um, beneficiaries should be taking income arising in the course of administration of an estate that's paid out to them. Um, as, uh, as as income in their own right, and they should be refining their income tax returns uh, for the various years. Again, strictly speaking, not sure how much is happening in practice. Um, they should be reopening tax returns going back um, over the years uh, in, to tie in with the, uh, the years that the income rose to the estate um, and taking a credit then for the tax that's paid by the estate during the uh, during the administration. The um, revenue uh, practice where the will agree um, to, to treat beneficiaries uh, that are tax residents in Ireland as exceeding to income from the date of debt. Um, and uh, if it's a straightforward case revenue, we'll usually uh, agree to that and then there's no requirement for the estate to file a return, it just cuts that out, the tax they're going to get is the same. So if they're happy they're going to get the tax anyway, they're not really too concerned if the estate files a, uh, a return, but if there's a non-resident, um, they're, uh, they're, um, they're not supposed to. I've seen them do it for a non-resident, but they're, uh, I think when we go over it's not supposed to. Not that I think that that's actually published anywhere at the moment, but revenue still seem to do it as a practice. I suppose on the, rev on the subject of revenue practice, 
and uh, clearance and estates. Um, there is currently a, a lack of clarity on, on tax clearances for estates. Um, there was a part 41.0.1 of the revenue manual which has been offline for uh, a number of years at this stage um, and um, it dealt with the uh, income, um, oh, sorry, the tax position on a disposal by an estate or income rising to an estate in that case is where a person representative wants to get some closure on the tax liabilities. As with any liability of an estate, uh, pre debt liabilities, estate liabilities, it's the person representative that's responsible for dealing with those liabilities and tax is no different. Um, so I think understandably, um, uh, I suppose practitioners and, and person representatives are a little bit nervous about uh, no revenue clearance. On, uh, on liabilities uh, linked into the um, the assets of into the tax liabilities of the estate, and in particular, I think the pre-debt liabilities, because there's a very much a lack of control over what happened pre-debt, and in a lot of cases, there's a lack of information as well in terms of disposals of assets potentially that haven't been returned for tax purposes um, that the person representative is on the line for, but um, the information uh, isn't necessarily there for them to deal with liabilities that don't matter about it. Um, but if revenue were to come across it by doing a some sort of uh, a uh, a data analysis or a particular focus on a particular uh, area, um, the, uh, the code base queries, um, and um, strictly speaking, first representative has, has distributed, then there is um, there's, there's no real um, comeback to the, uh, or the difficult, I suppose, kind of, you have damages and the likes, but also getting difficult to enforce sometimes then as well. So there is a um, revenue refined practice or issue in that is no in that cases, um, and also for non resident vendors. So, in debt cases, you're looking at primary liability for personal representatives. In non-resident vendor cases, you're looking at secondary liability um, to uh, CGT and revenue take the view to secondary liability to income tax as well, potentially uh, for agents acting in respect of the sale of property where it's a non-resident vendor. Um, revenue are we find in practice issuing letters no audit um, as a form of clearance which linked back to the revenue manual which is no longer live. Um, and will also generally issue tax finalization and pre debt and estate taxes. Um, but there's no actual formal revenue uh, clearance there at the moment. Um, it's a risk area, I see it as a, as a big risk area for, for personal representatives who, who don't have any sort of real formal clearance to get this letter in the wallet, but what does this, it, it really mean if revenue really decided to, uh, to dig their heels in? So there's a TAP subgroup at the moment, which is liaising with revenue we've met uh, last week. Um, we're meeting again at the end of the, the month, um, and the view is to get a revenue manual which will, I suppose, set, deal with the, the debt cases, deal with non-resident vendors, and um, publish.